was a fight. I was stretching and stretching, you know. I almost felt my joint collapse. The battle that 14-year-old Abraham Daniel won was the one to stand up and walk, something he hadn't done in over four years. Abraham used to be a quadriplegic, he fell off a scaffold and splintered his spine. Doctors said he would be an invalid for life. That is, until he came to Harlem Horizon Art Studio at New York's Harlem Hospital to paint on large canvases. It's here that the art of healing took its course. Everyone was really impressed with the amount of time that he was able to stand and to paint. And then when, and the second day when he finished it, he was able then to, um, to walk to the bathroom. Everyone stood and watched him walk down the hall. Uh, you know, it was a, it was a pretty uh, overwhelming um, experience. Artist Bill Richards has seen many such miracles. He's the director of the Horizon Art Studio, where the goal is to mentally, and sometimes physically, rehabilitate kids with serious injuries. Paint, canvas, and encouragement are the tools. Everyone comes in and sort of plugs in, and it feeds off itself, and uh, everything is coming out of the children's experiences and, and their feelings. So the children who have been badly injured and or, or very ill, it gives them a, a, a release. Horizon Art Studio exists in what was a pantry at Harlem Hospital. Outside sits a tough, dangerous part of Manhattan. But here, ill kids, as well as some neighborhood locals, find a safe haven. Kids like Abraham, who arrives by ambulance three times a week with his home care attendant, Deborah. Yeah, it's upside down. <laughs> is that right? It is a place where he can express himself and his fears. There's a lot of things you could put on or put in in a canvas or a mule or scale that size. Figures, heads, abstract, inspirational. Only I, only I could do it. Because I don't think nobody feels the way I do. Feeling is also what 12-year-old Jason Butler puts into his paintings. Horizon helped him recuperate from a car crash that shattered both of his legs. His art reflected his pain. The, the subject matter was um, uh, uh, standing figures. And um, it was interesting because the figures reached from the bottom of the canvas to the top. They were enormous standing figures. And we would ask him, you know, what they were doing, and he said they were not doing anything. They were just standing there. So, I mean, clearly, the idea of just being able to stand was the most important thing to him, which he couldn't do and he didn't do for three months. Over 300 kids have passed through the studio's doors. But hospital doctors feel painting isn't the only healing agent at work. There is the bonding between the children. And there is also bonding with the old. We're more like uh, mentors in some respects than, than teachers. You know, we're sort of the coach and we cheer them on. I think sometimes our role is more uh, paternal or brotherly, but I mean, they know we're here for them. What I love about painting is I can be an art tick one day. You know? Then everybody I'll be coming to my art class looking at me. That may well happen. Unlike other paint therapy classes, Richards teaches his students to think like artists, to cultivate their talent. There have been results. People like Bill Cosby have bought some of their paintings for as much as $4,000. And they've also been displayed in New York City art galleries. There is also praise. It represents vibrancy, it represents hope to me, it represents optimism, and because of who's doing it, I think that's very significant. I think the, the work is excellent. It's work I'd be proud to show. Words like that are priceless to these children, 
and so are people like Bill Richards. No, they are not the cure, but they're potent medicine for someone like Abraham. There are people who help me raise my spirit when I'm feeling down. Make me feel good, although I don't show it much. But you can see it in my work. I like what I'm doing. You walk to that gravesite and you see a stone, and in your mind you say, no, it cannot happen. You say, no, it didn't happen to my son. My daughter is in prison for life in a maximum security facility with no incentive of ever going home and she didn't murder anyone. A mother demands justice for a daughter locked in a cell for life. A father seeks vengeance for a son shot dead. The tragic stories of two New Hampshire families joined by marriage separated by murder. It's a terribly sad thing that, again, that we're not grieving together. That bothers me tremendously. The grieving began on May 1st, 1990, the night 24-year-old Greg Smart arrived home to find three teenage boys lurking just inside the door. They put a knife to his throat, forced him to kneel, then shot him in the head. It was a small-town crime that took on almost epic proportions, a murder scripted for Hollywood, a trial made for television. And in the glare of the international spotlight stood Greg's widow, Pam, the widow accused of orchestrating his murder. She confessed to seducing 15-year-old Bill Flynn. Did you have sex with him when he came home? Yes. Did you watch that movie nine and a half weeks? Yes but she denied persuading Flynn and his friends to kill her husband. Still, a taped conversation between Pam and a friend helped persuade 12 jurors beyond a reasonable doubt that Pamela Smart was, as one newspaper put it, an evil schemer, not an innocent victim. A former headline has mouth off to the perfect I'll say you, is the defendant guilty or not guilty of the offense charge? Guilty. <laughs> I am required and do hereby sentence you to the New Hampshire State Prison for Women for the remainder of your life without the possibility of parole. Since her sentencing last year, Pam's parents have begun campaigning to overturn her conviction. They send out newsletters, hold fundraisers, and have hired a top-notch Boston attorney. Greg's parents have been trying to stop these efforts through the legal system, through lawsuits that would tie up the Wojcic's money. For both sides, once simple dreams of happiness for their children have turned into complex legalities. I feel like all we need is a um, new trial, a fair trial, and there are several things that will surface. We have the right to sue her through a civil wrongful death lawsuit. And Bill Smart is exercising that right. He is suing his daughter-in-law for five million dollars. You can call it revenge. You can call it vengeance. But I would like to have some people in this world understand what it is to lose a child. I not only know how awful I feel about Greg, and I can only begin to imagine their pain. The suffering, the pain, and the loss has no dollar amount. Will money help soothe any person's grief? We're doing this to stop some appeal money that she's getting contributed to her appeal fund by people who believe that she was unjustly tried. The so-called Pam Smart Defense Fund apparently is more than a nickel and dime charity. According to bank records obtained by Smart's attorney, Leslie Nixon, Pam's supporters have contributed at least $34,000. The account's been cleaned out. I assume it's been used to pay her attorney. Those monies were used for the intended purpose to purchase the transcripts and the costs incurred in her appeal. If the effect of this lawsuit is in some way to stop or, or limit the funding, 
that she's able to obtain for her appeal from other people, I, I think that's a good result. The result so far is a victory of sorts. The Smarts have won the case by default, since neither Pam nor her attorney, Al Johnson, have responded to the lawsuit. The lawsuit is frivolous. Anything which would have been done to answer it would have simply given dignity to something which doesn't deserve dignity. Well, I'm disappointed that Mr. Johnson, who is a very good lawyer as I understand, and and has been involved in the legal system himself for so many years, would, would say something like that, because he knows well that it is not frivolous. The fact that makes it frivolous is that they know there is no expectation of a monetary recovery. Because she has no money now doesn't necessarily mean she will never have any money. A New Hampshire court has already granted the Smarts a $1 million attachment. That means all of Pam's assets, including any money her parents are holding for her, are frozen until a judge rules on the lawsuit. Now the Smarts are seeking to have the attachment increased to $5 million. But Pam's lawyer says he knows nothing about it. I'm not aware of any attachments of any kind. But there is an attachment of another kind that both sides readily acknowledge, one that needs no legal paperwork. Greg had two big dimples like this. And when he walked through the door, both, they were huge. This boy was an enthusiastic, happy, carefree, love life type of person. And I always used to think he was laughing at me. And I thought, what is so funny? He had an open personality, and he had a very pleasant personality. And then I realized that was just his manner. He had a perpetual smile on his face. doing anything. And a policeman came down the stairs, and she said, because he's dead. The worst moment was when I was told that Greg was dead. That's the worst part, is seeing him laying there, okay, all crumpled up. She called me and she was frantic and she said, Mom, please come here. And I could see his whole body and his head and his shoulders and so on and so forth. And that image will not go out of my brain. And she was sobbing and I said, Pam, what's wrong? I knew something was dreadfully wrong. And she said, Mom, Greg's dead. In January, the Smarts changed the epitaph on their son's tombstone because they say Pam did not pay the bill. She still has pot on that stone. There's a heart and a rose that she picked out. As much as we cannot tolerate this woman, we still gave her pot. They may have removed that message from his gravestone, but as she said in the newsletter that you may read, they'll never remove those moments from her heart. Almost two years after Greg's death, there are no signs of peace, just loud cries for justice. Pam Smart's appeal is pending before the New Hampshire Supreme Court. This case is one of the most colossal failures of the judicial system that I have seen in my 35 years as a lawyer. Johnson has filed some 1,200 documents on Pam's behalf to the Supreme Court. He says the trial court committed at least 37 errors which resulted in her unjust conviction. Topping the list of mistakes, according to Johnson, is the judge's failure to sequester the jury. Jurors were allowed to come and go from the courthouse at such times as the media, that is the print media and the electronic media, was constantly churning out negative publicity about Pam Smart. The question is, did those 12 jurors who decided Pam Smart's case, did they give her a fair trial in that they decided the evidence based on what they heard in that courtroom? Paul Maggiato prosecuted the Smart case for the state of New Hampshire. So far, uh, it's the state's position. Uh, we have seen no evidence whatsoever to suggest that these jurors were somehow influenced by the media. I pray to God, as my wife does, that we don't ever have to sit through another trial because I don't believe either of us could do it. I hope someday, Pam will, someday soon, Pam will be able to sit here instead of me. Till death did them part. For Pam and Greg's parents, all that's left is the hope for different endings to the same tragic story. I sometimes ponder at how awful they're going to feel in light of their behavior when Pam is free. I absolutely trusted her. She betrayed us. Free because she's found 
not guilty of those charges. We took it into the family. Free because she had nothing to do with her husband's death. We had some good times together, and we did love her. Our town is a shambles. Folks we treasured have gone. The street seems deserted. We people so forlorn. This mine fire issue came from below. Settled in Burnsville and Centralia. It is Molly Dara's Song of Despair about Centralia, Pennsylvania, her home of 66 years. She is one of 84 residents living in this small town nestled in the heart of the state. For 30 years, nearly half of Molly's life, a coal mine fire has been raging under Centralia's streets. Its ominous presence is everywhere. A constant smolder of smoke rises from the ground. Boreholes monitoring the fire's temperature are all around. So are sinkholes, which occasionally open with no warning. The rotten egg smell of sulfur dioxide from the fire hangs in the air and is killing the trees. You would think people like Molly would want to leave and move far, far away. But that is not the case. Centralia's residents are fighting to stay in the place they call home. The state wants them to evacuate in the next two years. It claims they're in danger from the fire. Centralians say the blaze is moving away from their town, so there's no need to go. I couldn't give you one reason to leave. Not one. Not one reason to leave. We have no problem. We have no gases. Like I said, if, if we had them, I'd be out of here. Centralia has seen better times. In the late 1800s, this tight-knit community prospered as a mining town, with one of the largest deposits of anthracite coal in the area. In the 1940s, the mines closed down because oil replaced coal as the popular heating fuel. The unfortunate chapter in Centralia's history began in 1962, when an underground fire at the town's dump ignited some of the coal seams beneath the land. For years, the state tried to put the fire out, but failed. What it did succeed in doing was to open a floodgate of media attention, National Enquirer articles, a Superman comic book based on the town's troubles. State health reports showed no real patterns of severe illness from the fire. But in 1983, a report from the U.S. Office of Surface Mining said the relocation of Centralia's homes and businesses was, quote, a course of action worthy of consideration, unquote. Soon after, the federal government gave the state a $42 million grant to buy the town's homes and relocate its residents. Back then, people had the choice to stay or go. The media hype made many flee. 200 voted to stay, 345 voted to relocate, which is a 63 to 37% ratio. The hysteria in the beginning was, you know, I'm going to die, I'm going to wake up dead some morning. Uh, people, the meters, they had carbon monoxide meters in their houses, and the bells were ringing in the middle of the night, and they'd have to get up and go down, open all the windows in the middle of the winter, and, and you know, try to live under those conditions. Jack Carling is the head of Pennsylvania's Community Affairs Disaster Program. He has helped relocate all of Centralia's residents. He believes its remaining townspeople must go. All of the studies that have been made said ultimately the fire will consume up to 3,400 acres uh, of the township and, and the borough. When that will be is, is not scientifi scientifically predictable, and, and that's the dilemma. I don't even know if, you know, where they just, how they can justify it or what they have to back up these charges. I just, I just don't know. Centralia Mayor Anne-Marie Devine says the state study is outdated and inconclusive. She claims the fire is actually moving away from the town, so residents should not have to evacuate. Devine says the state has a more sinister motive for driving them out, the coal under the town. The fact that the borough very uniquely owns the mineral rights beneath the town, and you are talking literally millions and millions of tons of coal. Should we cease to exist as a borough, uh, our mineral rights would then revert back to other uh, governmental agencies. Um, I question the motives, definitely. Devine says if the state really wanted to help, it would not have neglected the real problem, putting out the fire. I'd say this is 20-some years ago. They were within $5,000, and the contractor ran out of funds, 
And instead of allowing him an extension to his contract, they made him rebid. And in that process, this buyer just jumped completely out of control. Everybody can be a Monday morning quarterback and say, well, they should have got enough money and solve it with a couple hundred thousand rather than $42 million now. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't, wasn't done. Jack Carling says Mayor Devine's logic is absurd. The cost of extracting uh, the coal in a mine fire area, in this area particularly, would far exceed its value. So that's what the experts have, have said. There, there just is no, there, there's no mining uh, uh, plot to, to get the coal. That's, uh, that's just ridiculous. May you all go to hell! But the thought of such a plot, plus the belief that they aren't in any danger, has made Centralia's residents all the more determined to stay and fight the state which is now threatening to invoke its power of eminent domain if the people don't accept a relocation and buyout. These people are being treated worse than the PLO. We are being kicked out of our homes. I'm sorry, I do not believe that the Centralia Mine Fire is affecting people at any age. I would come back to the test. Don't let the scary old work. Some officials are now starting to side with Centralia, like State Representative Bob Belfonte, who says that ordering the remaining residents out is unfair. Well, if they were going to do that, they should have said that 12 years ago or 10 years ago when people were getting uh, offers. Uh, but that wasn't the case. And to change the game now in the ninth inning is just unfair to those folks. We have tracked this fire for some 12 years. We know that it is going that way. Belfonte has his own solution. He thinks people who live near the underground fire should be moved to the other side of town where the fire is not expected to spread. So far, other officials have ignored his plan, continue to try to force everyone out. Not knowing if they're staying or going has made it hard for the town to survive financially. Only two businesses, a cycle shop and a dress factory, remain. Centralia's budget continually shrinks. Last year it was $49,000. Mayor Devine and other town officials make only $20 a month each. Devine says things will only get tougher, but the town is prepared to stick it out and win. We're not looking for support. We're not looking for financial aid. We just want to get on with our lives. And we haven't been able to do that with them here. Most of the people left in Centralia have spent their entire lives there. They are elderly, and they say leaving their homes now would probably kill them. Molly Dara says she will get her house appraised by the state, but that's all. She still has no intention of leaving Centralia. She says there's no place like home. People make the town, the people stick together, and they all love one another. And it's, it's just great. It's the people. And we've been battling and battling and battling. So sooner or later we should win. Each day at evening tide When we seek haven from our daily care You'll find us at God's side It's really peaceful there We kneel in our solitude and silently pray for God to protect us, soon there'll come a day We'll pass through Centralia in our own streets again And be little Centralia 